Hi, Timmy. You having a nice laugh, are you? I mean, it's Christmas. It's Christmas morning. I love the way it makes me feel inside. What's up everyone, Adam from FWCI. This is Mr. McMahon, sorry. Mr. McMahon, episode four, Attitude. Is the next one gonna be Ruthless Aggression? So far I'm enjoying this documentary. Uh, I haven't seen anything on here that was explicitly incorrect. I've been listening to Cornette's reviews after I watch each episode and he's had some criticisms and stuff, but I don't know enough about it to sort of, you know, say one way or the other. I guess Cornette is right, he was there. But there are a few things that they kind of skimmed over that I thought they would do more with uh, like the Nancy Argentina situation in particular that's the main one that I was surprised they kind of glossed over what Vince's involvement was in that I think it was just one person I think it was Tony Atlas saying that yeah he probably made it go away and that was about it but we just went through the screw job story we're now up to the attitude era and the inception of the Mr. McMahon character and this is where really my knowledge of his career is like from this point onwards. I knew a lot of the other stuff from back in the day, but this is where I was personally following along and living and experiencing these characters. And even though Vince McMahon himself has got a lot of uh, questionable views on things, to say it very mildly, the Mr. McMahon character was this beautiful blend of fantasy and reality. And if you could watch it and know that it was completely um you know devoid of what the guy was like in real life it probably would be much easier to stomach but with all the real life allegations and then how this character manifested on screen and then you consider the fact that vince himself has complete autonomy over this company and can script any storyline he wants he can approve any storyline he wants he's got complete creative control over what happens in this thing with the exception of with Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan I guess but anybody that's a nobody or on the way up Vince McMahon controls your career and that's what makes it a little bit gross to watch back on some of these very entertaining Mr. McMahon segments that is like oh you can't help but now wonder how comfortable certain people were with certain things I wonder if we're gonna oh we are gonna see Trish Stratus on this aren't we we saw her name was Pat Patricia Strategarium or something. But let's jump into this one. This is episode four, Attitude. Sir Jerry Graham is not the favorite citizen in this arena. Really? But he's a doctor. Why don't they like him? He was a doctor, obviously. Oh, uh, I stand corrected. <laughs> really? That man's not a doctor? Because I never liked the good guys. I wanted to be like him so badly, I convinced my stepmother to dye my hair blonde. Oh my God, please give us a photo of this. So he sort of took me under his wing. Oh, wait, he did? Walking the horn, going through intersections, regardless of the light was green or red. And it's like, this is grand. Man, I wouldn't live my life like this. Really? Fucking hell. Yeah, you're supposed to grow out of that, though, Vince. <laughs> In January 2024, Vince McMahon resigned from WWE after allegations involving sexual misconduct, assault, and trafficking. The majority of the following interviews, including with McMahon, were filmed before the... Uh, yeah, we know that. What are you, what are you, why are they reminding us of that? got a hold of the behind the scenes information and that was spreading like wildfire you're seeing the reaction oh who found out about that just quickly there's a uh, a podcast called the solomons to sound off and i don't think he does it anymore but for a while he was doing these segments where he would go back to the uh pw scoops i think was the name of the message board but he would go back and read these like old message boards from like the very inception of wrestling message boards and it was crazy the amount of like inside shit being discussed back in like 1992 on the internet it really is crazy i think he's got videos on his youtube channel solomon's to sounds off go check it out if you haven't seen those because it was really fucking interesting listen the montreal screwjob to me as a canadian like i fucking hated this <laughs> i bet you did tries to explain it did he didn't come off very well. Brett screwed Brett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? It didn't come off well. <laughs> Why not turn that into business? You is now. Yeah, I mean, it's probably the biggest Hail Mary, nothing but net 
last minute shot of all time and it just fucking won the championship. The challenge that you have received from WCW, if I look at cable listings for January in one week, WCW is number one. Can I just say, Michael Landsberg did some amazing interviews, especially in the like uh, late 90s, early 2000s with wrestlers. He was one of the only places that would speak to them kind of out of character and as professionals, you know, of a certain, you know, art form. But he, I don't know what happened to him. He started getting really, really weird. His interview with Punk uh, in when Punk was off doing UFC, that was so bizarre. Landsberg looked like a vampire in that interview. He was very rude. It was just, it seemed like he was trying to get a rise out of Punk. And it kind of worked because Punk was like, fuck you. So yeah, mixed feelings on Landsberg. He did great work, but then he started to kind of become a little bit sleazy with his interviews. Through 97... WCW, they were just so far ahead and their product was better. So I'm just thinking, it's like, this is just a domination. Wow. You know what's crazy about that is 1997 was a very, very good year for WWF. Like, the entire year was pretty good. That was like the first breakout year I thought was 1997. So it's interesting that WCW was winning in the ratings that entire time. You sort of feel it. It's time for a change. It was time for us to uh, take another step. So Mr. McMahon came in right at the very end of 97. It was absolute war between the two franchises. It'll be me and you, McMahon. <laughs> Bischoff. I love that he challenged Vince to a shoot fight. We in the WWF think that you, the audience, are quite frankly tired of having your intelligence insulted. Vince. All right. Let's just marinate on the fact Vince McMahon is saying that he thinks the audience are tired of having their intelligence insulted. As he would go on for the next, what, 20 odd years insulting the audience's intelligence like nobody ever has before. Was there a distinctive moment when the Attitude Era was born? Mm, yeah. Brett. I think the Attitude Era was born when, <laughs> oh no, really, this is what it was? Shawn Michaels came down in bicycle shorts, and right before he went out, he... All right, before they go into this, I thought it was uh, Brett shoving Vince down and saying, this is bullshit, uh, that um, mad is not the goddamn word for it, or something along those lines. I always said that that was kind of the moment. It was gauze, it wasn't the sock, it was gauze that had wadded up from the trainer table. <laughs> You go back and watch that and tell me if that isn't funny. If we're talking about entertainment, it was very entertaining. Yeah, exactly. That's it. The conversations of, you know, we need to start going there. I felt like you can have respect for this line of work, but you don't have to act like it's freaking not weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's attitude. That's what he said. He's got attitude. We need more attitude. The Attitude Era was born. Okay, all right, Pritchard, if that's what you reckon. They were an offshoot of the clique. They were anti-authority. And there's something about anti-authority at this time that really spoke to fans. Yeah, because the NWO was happening at the same time, like a year before. <laughs> and then there's a flip moment in time where all of a sudden it's, hey, that worked. Do that again. Oh, my bro! What is... <laughs> Attitude era. It was a wild time. <laughs> Enter Stone Cold Steve Austin. ECW was the necessary disruption of the pro wrestling slash sports entertainment industry. Yeah, that is the perfect wording. This can't possibly be legal. What the fuck am I watching atmosphere? <laughs> it was a mosh pit. <laughs> ECW was a wild ass renegade type promotion that attracted a niche uh, audience. And it was. Wrestling is a niche audience, Vince. When we get to the King Ring pay per view, I'm wrestling Mark Merrill first. We do a move, he kicks me. Hey, oh, is that where it happened? Holy shit. Hospital immediately and get 14 stitches. I always knew he busted his mouth open, but I didn't realize it was from that particular move. That was bizarre. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. That may not play too well, you know, and the Bible Belt. Piss off. 
<laughs> Great edit. That's interesting because Austin said that it was already a thing to take John 316 signs to the um, football. So you would imagine that a reason, one of the reasons that the Austin 316 signs all started popping up is because it was already kind of a gimmick somewhere else. So it kind of naturally translated to the world of wrestling that, hey, if I take this sign like they do on the football, that'll look good. And fortunately, it hitched everybody to the wagon of Stone Cold Steve Austin, which was a great move for everybody involved. We really thought we had a better show. We're like, man, what is up with these ratings? Someone's got to be paying somebody off. We got a better show than they do. Yeah, yeah, 97. I could see that happening. Late 97 Raw is fucking awesome. Something in a really big way for WrestleMania. That's what we did. Mike Tyson, yeah. I was so far on ahead of him at that point. I was like, yeah, whatever. I was arrogant. He goes, they're bringing in Mike Tyson. I got uncocky real fast. <laughs> he hadn't been arrested for rape yet, though, when we did that, right? He had? Yeah, he had. <laughs> Thoughts, Stephanie? <laughs> he certainly, his public image is certainly in a better place than it was at that point. Yeah, that is true. That is very true. He has definitely redeemed himself in terms of years and years, decades now of positivity. And we also got this. Mike would be the special guest referee between Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Shawn Michaels. Yeah. And three massive names in hindsight, historically speaking. Uh, Shawn had a real bad back, and so that match was very forgettable. Michaels going for another tip. Austin... Yeah, I don't recall that match being overly entertaining. It's a hell of a quick count, though, Mike. <laughs> I've always been a good guy. Uh, but they're booing you. They're booing you now. Always be a good guy. Oh, okay. Interesting exchange. Who's that guy? That reporter. The control. You've got the eccentric billionaire boss, Vince McMahon, and then you've got the anti-system Stone Cold Steve Austin, and they were perfect for perfect. each other. Perfect, yep. It was such an ideal fit, those two characters, the whole storyline. This was lightning in a bottle. With a good guy and a bad guy. Vince Jr. made it the bad and the worst. <laughs> yeah, good point. We cater to what is in front of us. You tap into that. That's big money. So Vince said, hey, give me some of that money. <laughs> yeah, Tony Atlas is 100% correct. That late 90s, like 98, 99 especially, was such a... Oh my god, like, so many subcultures started to just flourish around that time. The wrestling subculture, hip-hop subculture, indie music subculture, punk, grunge, everything had this boost. I, I guess it was maybe the internet becoming so much more, like, widely available or something like that, but... I was a teenager in that era and it really was like all these very, very different groups of people with these very different um, interests all just off in their own world doing their own thing. And it was it was a very wild time and WWF in the position they were in and like I say, the planets aligning the way they did for them, they were set up to change the world of wrestling, entertainment, so many other things. Feels like smashing a beer bottle, he doesn't. Feels like throwing up his middle finger, he doesn't. <laughs> the man loves smashing beer bottles and flipping the bird. You can't go around shoving people. You can't go around insulting people. Pro wrestling is the like embodiment of the most basic um, human emotions. Fear, anxiety, happiness, sadness, joy, anger. And Stone Cold Steve Austin just taps into that you know envy i guess and that you know what's what that little voice in the back of our head that we have to not listen to otherwise we get arrested stone cold was that and everybody everybody can relate to that live vicariously through those kind of storylines and would love to punch your boss in the mouth exactly there you go literally and figuratively do that most every monday night on raw <laughs> <laughs> I think the one where Austin was going to execute Vince was maybe a bit much. What's to like? He's yeah. easy to hate. Yeah, <laughs> very true. And he became the most hated character in the history of the business. Definitively. I really think. 
definitively the most hated character of all time. I don't like rich people because I was around some people who thought they were better than me because they had, quote, more money. So. Oh, give me a second to just fucking deal with that statement there. He's, I, I mean, I've never met the guy, but he sounds like a monumental hypocrite every time he talks about this kind of stuff. Oh, I hate lawyers. Really? Lawyers have kept your ass afloat for most of your adult life. Come on, man. You didn't fight fair. You cheated. Right. Yeah, I won. <laughs> okay. It's not my fault that I happen to be a self-made billionaire. It was easy for me to get into that character because I knew all the things that I disliked. So why is that character so similar to who you are in real life then, Vince? That's the question we're all asking. Some people are rich oh, and boy. you're not. What are your thoughts on life, Vince? This is what I think of Texas. Such a great feeling. Vince was a master at making people care. <laughs> All right, I can see how some people might look at that and think that that means he's a very twisted individual. But there are a lot of wrestlers who have been great heels over the years and gotten amazing amounts of McMahon level heat and also are normal human beings when the camera stops rolling. Just want to put that out there. And what similarities do you share with Mr. McMahon? character Mr. Man with me? Yeah. None whatsoever. Oh my god. Fuck off. I, okay. Shane is right here. Mr. McMahon is an extension of Vince McMahon. Yeah. Wow. I can't believe he just said that. The difference between Mr. McMahon and Vince McMahon. <laughs> Probably not that much. <laughs> exactly the same person. Oh my god. Vince is hating this. <laughs> I've had actually cut on me in real life. I'd never say yeah. that. Well, there you go. Sometimes that passion is a bit effusive. So I probably can get out of bounds a little bit. Like the Mr. McMahon character can get out of bounds? Like that? Is that what you mean by that, Vince? That you just fucking denied? God, he is just... He's pathetic. He's pathetic. It doesn't matter what you want, Vince. It doesn't matter how you want to be perceived. It's the way you are being perceived. The double bird! Pure hatred! Mr. McMahon! Austin McMahon? That dynamic was just ridiculously good. Yeah, that's how you explain it. It was perfect. Vince took our formula, decided he was going to do it, only he was going to do it better. And he did. Mm, yeah, I guess he did. He really did. DX was nothing more than a derivative of the MWL. Agreed. The Mr. McMahon character was a derivative of evil Eric Bischoff. Mm, I, the, Mr. Mc, the Mr. McMahon character is way too natural for it to be a derivative of anything, but they definitely did it first. They definitely did it first. Now, granted, you did it better, but come on, who did it first? Yeah, I agree. Well put. He played the heel character before I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait. Vince, are they going to show the clip of Vince going to... Memphis and doing heel Mr. McMahon in like fuck like 95 or something so good for him <laughs> alright Austin was an incredible 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 success and then Dwayne The Rock Johnson comes do you smell what The Rock is ladies and gentlemen making Austin Rock both at the same time I mean yeah, you don't get that very often. It's like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Magic Johnson being on the same team. It's, it's just not fair. Everything he do is just like his father. Walk like his father, rest like his father. You didn't know nobody. You think that Rocky Johnson. I remember meeting Vince McMahon Jr. Dewey, I see you there. And no matter how hard uh, Dwayne worked in the ring, initially people started pulling him. I'm sick of hearing about Rocky Maivia's old man. Who cares? <laughs> Good work, Lola. It's based on pride in being of color and not being held down by the man. Yeah, that's a very uh, diplomatic way to put it there, Rock. <laughs> I got three words. Die, die Rocky, die. <laughs> you know, sometimes in our lives we find these moments where there's a shift and a click and you go, 
man, there is some real power behind that. That is great advice, yeah. I know what he means. He was always about, I don't care what color you are. You could be black and green and purple. And you could be a unicorn for all I give a shit. <laughs> as long as you are drawing money, you will be champion. Interesting take. I, know, I bet that's going to reignite the conversation about how many black WWE champions there have been over the years. He don't see black. He don't see white. He see only green. <laughs> Tony, you have a way with words. Whatever you can imagine, we can do. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining you giving Mick Foley a life-threatening concussion at the Royal Rumble in 99. Merchandise was everywhere. The influence was all over the culture. <laughs> you invited The Rock to speak at the Republican National Convention? <laughs> Oh my god, really? Yeah, I'm a dude on TV that people recognize occasionally too. You can't go anywhere. It was a boom. It was an explosion of popularity. It just went everywhere. In Australia, I remember when the Attitude Era boomed. We didn't get any WWF on TV at all. And they advertised for like weeks. WWF Superstars is going to be on like... I think it was going to be like a Saturday night at like 7 p.m., which is a good time slot for like a kid's show kind of thing. And it was like a two month old episode of um, WWF Superstars. I remember specifically it was uh, it was covering SummerSlam 98 and that was on twice in that time slot, seven o'clock on a Saturday night. And then it just I, I don't know whether the ratings didn't do well because wrestling's not overly popular in Australia it's popular but it's not overly popular and I'm not sure if it was because the content on it because this was like peak attitude era that they wanted to put it in different time slots but after that WWF superstars just bounced around the schedule it was on at three o'clock on a Wednesday it was on a midnight on a Sunday it was on like all these it was just impossible to keep track of it but I did get to watch Monday Nitro on a regular basis that started airing on uh, Monday nights at like 2 a.m <laughs> 3 a.m so I'd set up a tape to record that and then wag my first lesson on Tuesday morning and watch uh, WCW Nitro but anyway, get back to it. Um, from a moral standpoint, yeah, morals are morals, but it, it rubbed some people the wrong way. One true thing about professional wrestling, millions of fans. Where's, where's much, Nick? What's he think about all of this? It was a lot of fun and it was a lot of freedom, but there's a lot of stuff online that you can watch. What the fuck was going on there? How did we ever get away with that stuff? You can take your pick of either one of these holes. <laughs> Godfather. He is great for a, a tiny soundbite. <laughs> the New York Post columnist Phil Mushnick. Mushnick, tell us what's up. Way with everything. Not anything, everything. This is where he really ramps up too. Um, but it was still family friendly. No one got killed. I don't know about that, Vince. <laughs> it might have been more family friendly if somebody was getting killed. No use of uh, knives or guns or anything like that. <laughs> Witness a recent on, simulated Vince. castration scene. So, it's still family friendly. Yeah, I don't think it is, mate. Not for young kids. <laughs> Do you know what family friendly even means? I think it was primarily aimed at young males. Action figures, dolls. These aren't being bought by and enjoyed by adults. These are hey! Easy there, Mushnick. It's a monster, is really what it is. It's a nationwide monster, it's gotta be stopped. <laughs> Says the principal of this school. Who live in your world don't like us. Click us off. Don't watch us. I mean, that I agree with. I, I was the one leading the charge in that, you know, don't tell us to raise your children, you need to raise yourself. And now, having a daughter, uh, I look, there are times we probably could have been a less, less objectionable towards our women. <laughs> I mean, even if you don't have a daughter, Shawn Michaels, that's a probably a, a safe thing to think. You look pretty damn good on your knees, China. It almost looks like a natural position. <laughs> oh, that's rough. Vince McMahon is part of his time. The difference is that he's in a distinctive position where he reinforces those tendencies rather than challenging. Yes, or changing exactly right. It's one thing to say, oh, this is how it was at the time, but 
he had the opportunity to be like, well, let's do better. Highest order hour, the highest rating in that segment were women. You mean tits? And honestly, there's nothing that happens on wrestling that's any crazier than what happens in movies, TV shows. It's not like it's that unusual, except that some people believe it. Who's worse, the guy that did it or the people that loved it? I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, it's quite a statement there, Triple H. Oh, okay, here we go. You want to leave? You know what, Brett? You say, well, I'd, I'd like to stay. It's time for me. Yeah, I. Mm. Is there any way to even confirm that that happened? Hypothesis that we would do something against Owen because Brett left. Only speaks to Brett's ego. Yeah. Ready, Brett? I kind of agree with that. Oh, oh, that's. Oh God, who's what? What is higher, Brett's ego or Vince's pettiness? I don't know. That's a hard one. Make Owen a star. You're trying to make Owen a star, Jesus Christ. You're gonna be the blue blazer again, and you're gonna be this sort of clumsy oaf hero. Yeah, okay. I'm starting to side with Brett a bit more now. I was on a flight, and I could feel something, something overcame me. And I can remember when something bad happened. I can feel it. Yeah, I mean, Brett, honestly, you could have that feeling seven days a week and you'd be right because your family's story is fucking tragic uh, we're here to entertain and have fun but this is neither no it's uh it's it doesn't look good at all oh that's you feel it in lola's voice there how the fuck did they continue on i have the unfortunate responsibility Imagine that, you're watching a wrestling show, you're expecting Godfather to have a match against the Blue Blazer, something happens off screen, and then, what, ten minutes later, they're announcing that he's dead. Like, oh my god. The decision that, uh, basically I had to make was whether or not the show goes on. The live audience didn't really see what happened. Had they seen, there's no question about it, you have to shut the show down. Oh, okay, alright, I mean... Owen Hart... I'm praying for you, buddy. And I am too. Yeah, he doesn't know right there that Owen's already passed. Like, literally just died in this ring, and his blood is right there, and we're going out there... Wait, really? ...form for this audience that doesn't even know it, while we're brokenhearted. What you do, your business, is entertainment. Oh, God, I didn't realize that his blood was still on the mat. That's fucked. Change the ring mat. What the hell? I think of Vince McMahon had dropped Shane McMahon from the ceiling. Uh, and he splatted on the mat. I don't think he would have scraped him off the mat and sent the next match out. Oh, wow. Oh, right, Vince is about to address that, but damn, that's Brett. Yeah, I, I fucking love Brett on this. He, I, sometimes he gets a little bit too much, but he really, really shoots hard. Not just my son, it had it been me who was splatter on the mat, as Brett said. I would want the show to go on. So get me out of there, you know? <laughs> what are you talking about? And to this day, I would. All right, Vince. So what you're saying is if it was Shane that you would continue on with the thing, right? That's your answer to that? And the manufacturer knew it was defective. And then we sued the manufacturer. Oh, congratulations. No one's saying I don't want to do that or that's too dangerous. But at some point, Enough is enough. <laughs> that what Hell in a Cell was, was it? Alright, that episode was not really any much new information in there. I guess we learned a little bit more about the incident with Owen, but I, there's more to that incident than what they talked about on here. There are questions around the company that they were using and things like that. So this episode of the documentary wasn't the most enlightening but it is a very interesting look at you know the monday night wars and the attitude era and that whole cultural shift that wwe was right in the center of i really want to hear them talk about the fact that vince booked stephanie mcmahon in a pay-per-view uh i quit match against vince like two weeks before her wedding to triple h where she could have 
broken her leg, she could have broken her hand, she could have got a black eye, she could have got a tooth knocked out, busted lip, whatever it was. And he still went ahead and booked that match, even though a family member of his was getting married, like, in a couple weeks time, where he has full autonomy. I always thought that that was, like, the one example of Vince McMahon just being a true asshole, like, being a really selfish and uncaring POS, you know what I mean? So I, I want to hear about that. That was 2003, I think that happened. So I hope we get some of that in the next couple of episodes. There's two more. I hope you're enjoying these reactions. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Go to patreon.com slash FWCI if you want to support the channel further. And subscribe here on YouTube if you haven't already. And as always, everyone, be well, stay safe, look after your friends. Ta-ta, and farewell. Farewell.